Yeah, that. I'm going to talk about how we made a particular Flink benchmark run faster than Flink had ever run before. Uh, Flink faster and furiouser. I'm Ted Dunning. I work at MapR. Normally, you'll see me wearing red or something. Uh, the hat is off for protest right now. I work for MapR. We build a platform that enables businesses to do amazing things. I also work in my own time as VP of Incubator at Apache, where we bring in a lots of things. Among my tasks at Apache have been uh, being the mentor for Apache Flink. That was some time ago, and Flink has come a very long way since then. You can get in touch with me many different ways. Uh, Apache emails, Gmail emails, MapR emails, whatever is good for you. Also, Twitter works. I'd like to point out that we have a new book. Well, we don't have the book yet. We have the PDFs. Those are available for free download if you follow that URL. The uh, squirrels on the cover were a very difficult thing to come by, but Ellen did it. Uh, she blamed Costas. Uh, she said he would be so sad if there were no squirrels on the cover. And they believed her. So this is a basic outline of what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about why streaming. I think it's actually a very important thing to remind ourselves of why streaming is probably one of the biggest, it is participating along with other big data technologies in the largest replatforming that we have seen in computing in 30 or 40 years. The last one was SQL. It was the last time that people actually dug up, tore out large scale enterprise software on a massive scale and replaced it with something new. And we're part of that revolution now where that's happening again. These big data techniques, these flexible data techniques, and as far as the execution model is concerned, these streaming data techniques are doing the same thing that happened starting in the early 70s. Uh, going to talk about what FAST is and how we make it happen. A little bit of reality check because how to make it happen will be a little bit theoretical, but let's talk about exactly how to make a particular benchmark run much faster. And some real results, and then deep mm, <clears throat> insights. So, uh, yay, we're in Berlin, can you tell? I don't think I like that, except that it's in Berlin. But I think the motto is you'll get used to it, right? So the question first, is this really a revolution that we see around us right now? Is this really as big a deal as people who work for companies say it is? Is it really changing things as much as we say? And I think the answer is yes. And I'm going to give just one example. We have many, many, many examples of how you can do these sorts of streaming adaptations to conventional compute or how you can do new kinds of compute. This is just going to be one of them. Suppose we have to build a small box that makes decisions. And for the purposes here, I'm pretending that it's a very, very simple fraud detection system. So the incoming request has uh, a card number, a location, and a time. And the response should be fraud or not fraud. And the decision should be made based simply on card velocity. Uh, if, if you have card present uh, transactions, if this card is in Berlin today, and five minutes later it's in Hong Kong, and three minutes after that it's in San Francisco, something's very wrong. There are not that many copies of this card, and so it could not have moved between those places, and therefore that's an indication of fraud. Now this is a primitive indication of fraud, but it's not a primitive indication of a decision of the sort you might have to make. It is something very similar to that, it just happens to have very simple internals. Now, the way that traditionally we would have built that is we would have the fraud detector, it would have a database. When the request comes in, it gets from the database the previous location, 
subtracts the distances, divides by the time, and has a velocity, and it has some cutoff, probably statistically generated, says, you know, if it's in the top 0.1% of distances, it's a fraud thing. In practice, of course, there's hundreds of indicators like that for a real fraud detector. But again, this is simple. So there's a profile database. It reads the old profile, combines it with the new request, and then writes back the results. This works. This is fine. This is the old school. It's not that the old school doesn't work where it works. It's just that it leads you to trouble. So the next thing that happens is we have to scale the system. And so we put three fraud detectors in this case, all attached to one database. They have to attach to the one database because you might do a transaction on one fraud detector and it would update your location. Then you have to do an update or a, a transaction on another one and it would do an update to the same database. Now, the natural consequence of sharing a database like this is the database becomes quite red and hot. Not because it cannot do what you've asked to do. Not because it cannot do things as fast as you would like it to do. It's easy to say, oh, streaming is so fast and so wonderful. But that's not really the point. The point is that the heat comes from the committee meetings that we have to have. So if somebody wants to change the schema of a shared database, you have to get everybody in the room. You have to get everybody in the room pretty much to agree or you have to inflict pain on them in their unwilling state. And so that's the real problem to sharing a database is that you affect other people adversely and very easily. And the worst thing about it is that the exact form of that database has a very, very big impact on performance. And so one application will need one thing and another will need something else entirely. The worst thing that happens is just after you've had this meeting for the nth time and, and people are screaming at each other, the CEO will walk in and say, you know, I saw at our competitors, they have this big dashboard in the lobby. Can we add that to this? And everybody just explodes because that's going to destabilize their entire system. These are symptoms of a disease. These are symptoms of a problem that is caused by sharing the database. A much more effective way to do this is to build an abstract block, an opaque implementation container, has the fraud detector, has a small database there, a private database, not a global one, and have all of the updates that would be made to the global database in the previous slide go out to a stream of some kind, a stream that contains business level objects. Now, sharing that stream is much, much easier than sharing the database was. And the reason is because it's easy for us to agree on what information needs to be in a business event. But it's very, very hard for us to agree, well, especially with you, I mean, just looking, I can guess it would be difficult. Uh, it's very difficult to agree on the exact form of the database we want to use. I want to use an in-memory database. He wants to use Postgres. I mean, I don't know why, but you know that sort of argument starts happening. And if we're sharing the database, we have to come to some agreement or we have to squish the other person. There's no other way because we share every aspect of it. But with a stream, we only have to agree on the general structure that we can all accept. We don't have to say, oh, I want an index here or I want a separate table there. That can be done in our private database. Agreeing on the general structure of a business event is really quite easy. And that doesn't change that often. And when it does change, we can use modern data structuring techniques to allow that change to be happening in a forward compatible way so that old applications can work on the new data, new applications can work on the new data, and gently, slowly, we can phase out the old systems. This decreases the heat. Now, when the CEO comes back down and says, I want my dashboard, we go, no problem. Because the performance of a stream, because it's doing a very simple thing, because it's purely 
appending to that stream. Yeah. This is a really good question. Why is it not writing to its own database? It's because we want all of the events to go out. Yes. We want no exceptions to the, everything that it says must change to go out. Exactly. It must be guaranteed that they expose everything. Therefore, we do not allow the fraud detector to write back, only the updater. And this is a, a critical thing. Otherwise, perhaps not on purpose, but somebody will cheat. Eventually, they go, I just write it back. Nobody will know. You cannot allow that. It must go through the big circle. But now, because this stream here is very high performance, because it's doing a very simple thing compared to what the database is doing, the dashboard is not a worry. The fact that we didn't know the specifications for the dashboard until the CEO walked in 15 minutes ago is not a problem. We can have the intern read from that stream and put up the dashboard with the flashy lights. It won't affect this fraud detector because there's this abstraction boundary around it. We could build an archive of data that for analytics purposes. We can do all these things even if they weren't written when we first built the fraud detector. We can now scale the fraud detector by simply building them separately. And his fraud detector can use whichever database he prefers. I can use whichever one I prefer. I can even, we can even do this trick as we change versions. So we use a load, load balancer that sends all the transactions to the top and send a few to the bottom, a more to the bottom, more and more until all of them go to the bottom. And we've transitioned from one version to the next. We can transition even between technologies, database technologies. And this is a horrifically hard problem without streaming. Doing this in conventional terms is nightmarish at best. And that's why people still run mainframes and mainframe databases. And that's why people, I, I was talking to some very advanced, very respected people in the US. Ooh, just caught myself. Uh, and they were all impressed with themselves. They'd spent $120 million on their systems, on their mainframes, and they could do 65,000 transactions per second. I could do that on my, my phone. And they spent $120 million to do this. I could use it, I mean, my phone is so old. It's, but my phone is as fast or perhaps a little bit faster than the Cray 1 was, which is not all that different from the time that their mainframes were designed. And so this allows us agility. This allows us opacity. The team building this bottom system doesn't have to answer to the system build, the people building the top system. We can make changes finally, which is something that's very hard to do in enterprises. It's very hard to do changes. And it's very hard to de-risk those. So Streams allows this, allows high performance processing, it allows lots of things, but the key thing it does is it liberates us from this social paralysis that results inevitably from sharing static data systems like databases. Now, before this can work, and this is a social issue that I'm talking about, not really a technical one, but we always say it as if it were technical. For this to work, the streaming system must be so fast and so general that nobody can ever object to using it. Is this room that we're in big enough? I can't reach the walls. I can't reach the ceiling. You can't reach the walls. You can't reach the ceiling. The room is big enough. Now, if I reached out and the, the wall over here was right there, and that wall was right there, and, and I, the ceiling was quite low, the room would not be big enough. So that's what we need in the streaming system, that the walls and ceiling be so far away that we can't reach them, except in very unusual situations when I'm on a very tall ladder, very extreme system. And that means 
if it's infrastructural, faster than you need, always there, it's like the air, you will use it. That's the key thing we need to do. So let's talk about how to make something really fast, because it's not just the transport. It has to be the application and the transport together. You know, this is how most people think of it. You make some data happen, you process, you know, push it into a stream, you process it, and this inevitably leads to world domination, right? Uh, that's the Silicon Valley business plan right there. This is the technical slide for a business plan, and it always goes roughly like that. Three steps and we own the world. Facebook will be a subset of what we do. It isn't quite like that, uh, at least not in the real world. Uh, it's not quite that simple to make the most amazing fast thing. Here, for instance, is a rather more complicated system. It's a recommendation engine. There are real-time flows in red. There are real-time flows that become semi-real-time, but much less critical path flows in black. And there's queues in different places. There's offline analyses. There's databases. There's recent history that becomes a query and so on. It's not as simple as the previous slide. No, it's not, because there's multiple paths, some with speed consideration, some not. Here's another one. This is a very much simplified diagram of an online user-generated video site that we built years ago. And we didn't, we drew it like this. This was very interesting to me. 10 years ago, we drew our system diagram like this, even though we didn't have streams. We wished we had it so much that we designed our system as if we had it. Now, the disaster was that every arrow was implemented differently. It was inevitable. No arrow previously would satisfy the needs of the next arrow. None of it was infrastructural, and none of them had a big enough room to be usable. So socially, we wanted with many implication, implementations. That was a long time ago. But you have p different paths that go different speeds. You have files. You have little tables in there. there. There's a lot of complexity in this, that it's not as simple to make it fast as the first diagram. Here is the system that I'm going to talk about more. This is the Yahoo Streaming Benchmark. It emulates what happens in an advertising system. The data coming in consists of ad impressions and clicks. Really, we don't care about the clicks in this, so we just get the impressions. But that says, ad got clicked. Now, some of those ads we care about, some we don't, so we throw away some. Some of the columns that come in we care about, some we don't, so we throw away some of those. And then we don't really want the ad, we want the campaign that sponsored the ad. And so we have a little database off to the side that says, this ad belongs to that campaign. So we augment the data with the campaign ID. Then we group by that campaign ID, and we do counting with a window. That was pretty natural for what Flink does, and there's no accident there. Flink was implemented to solve problems very much like this, many other problems as well. So this is not an unreasonable thing to ask Flink to do, and it's not an unreasonable thing to ask a computing system in general to do, because it's very close to what's needed. So, it again is not quite that simple. Part of the problem is that there are many, many potential bottlenecks. At the beginning, for instance, where the data generator for a benchmark or the actual data ingest happens, the ad server, the ad data generator, will have a connection, a client connection, to the streaming system. And all of the threads in that system will have to share that connection somehow, or they have many of those connections. But sharing those connections is how you get ordering in the context of the data producer. In order to get ordering, you have something like a lock, something like shared memory. And that gives you an opportunity for a bottleneck. Uh, within the impressions, the, the, the data stream right there, you probably have some number of partitions. These are parallel streams that allow you to compromise ordering a little bit in order to get parallel processing. How many of those? Well, having lots of partitions here 
may be good, but it may be bad because it will start consuming cores across your cluster. You have to decide there. And having few partitions might mean that your data is near the thing that processes it. Having many might mean that you're going to have a more general shuffle just to get to the filtering, the projection, the augmentation, and then the grouping. There are more things. There's another shuffle here when we do the group by, because it's usually done with a hash sort of uh, sort. And then we have to decide how many threads go for different parts of the computation. So it isn't quite that simple. And then, of course, everything's in parallel. Everything is going to be running on one machine or another. Under failure modes, we have to decide what's going to run fast enough. As a side note, we build a streaming transport, which is specifically intended for high performance. Let's talk a little bit about that. This is a very theoretical sort of thing. What we did originally over the whole community over many years is we built better and better file systems. It used to be that if I wanted a file on an application, we would have a committee meeting. I would have to say, did I have hardware budget for my file? Did I have an after hours contact for my file? Did I have a contingency plan if my file failed or grew too much? That was crazy, but we had to do it at the time. Now we don't because we may follow that big arrow. Now, unfortunately, we didn't have very much scaling. So 10 years ago-ish, Hadoop gave up much of that compatibility, much of the semantics in order to get scale. MapR decided to put some of that performance back, or the functionality back in to get similar levels, or higher of scale. That's our old logo. And then recently, we've added streams and tables into that same platform. So we now have a system that can do streams, tables, and files all together. And that's fast, according to Samsung. They say it's the fastest big data file system around. And it handles a lot of issues in a coherent way. So that's, that's the background, a little bit about what we do. It is intended, however, for very high performance, and that's why people often try to run on MapR to get the highest performance. That's why Samsung wanted to show off their new flash memory, because they knew it was fast and they knew we could drive it. The same thing is true for this Flink benchmark. And so MapR is very heavily threaded internally. That makes that whole calculus we had before much more complex. We can have as many as 50,000 threads per core running the file system. If you're using spinning media, it's almost never more than one core. But on SSDs, it could be four. And then you'd have 200,000 threads. Each client can have internal threads and parallelism that you don't see as well. The ordering boundaries require serialization. We mentioned that already at the client level, but also within the stream. Because even if two clients come in and send a a message into the same topic, there must be one order or another. And if we have to make serialization decisions, that slows down compute. Replication, splitting, data location are automated, uh, but that can have impacts on how the computation runs. Streams and Flink are in the same cluster, but you remember the shuffles still happen. It's not like Flink is always going to run right next to the data that it consumes. So. Initially, what happened is the assignment was made saying parallelism is good. And we're running on a cluster with many, many, many cores and a lots of nodes. So let's run 72 threads in each of 10 Flink executors, one on each machine, and run 72 partitions in the streaming system to kind of match the 72 threads on each of the machines. Now, this could be good. The, uh, the hot spotting that you might expect in a system like Kafka, where each partition lives on a single machine, is mitigated because the insert points will wander around with automatic splitting and so on. But by having so many threads per executor, we wind up hot spotting on the coordination just to use the client. And we also, by using so many threads, we allocated so many cores to application processes that we starved the internal system, of course, 
that it needed. So we made a big number of changes here, or big change. Um, one is we went to three Flink executors per node instead of one and gave each one one thread. This seemed counterproductive because these machines have some ungodly number of cores on them and we're saying just use three threads. And the fact is that allows those threads to run fast enough that they can then fill the parallelism on the rest of the system. So two task managers were running each of them one producer thread because producing the data is actually more expensive than processing it and one uh, Flink task manager on each node had one thread run, running the consumer rather than the previous 72. We also had to change the parallelism in the streams themselves to get many more partitions. We then changed to the single consumer thread, changed the shuffles a bit, but we still had good balancing between producer and consumer. This resulted in roughly a 250% improvement. And if we expanded the number of campaigns beyond 100 to a million or something like that, that shifts all of the bottlenecking to the final database output. So this is the sort of difference that we get with this tuning. This is before and that's after, a very substantial change. Before, we get performance that's not that different from what you can do on conventional hardware because you're locking up the hardware, you're not actually using it. After, we're not using it for the application, we're allowing the underlying system to have the parallelism, which is where it needs to be, and the speed goes back. No actual optimization of the program was really needed, just tuning of parallelism parameters. So, Note that the defaults are very different. We wound up with 300 partitions in the system. The default is 10. But 10 is actually not a bad thing if you have heavy multi-tenancy in the cluster. You don't necessarily want to swamp the cluster with one's program. Uh, asynchronous clients, which are built into this system, give us a huge amount of effective parallelism. And that was very surprising to us. We expected all of the parallelism we needed to do to be expressed in the application itself. But in fact, there was a large amount of parallelism being driven inside the systems, inside the file system, and was quite a surprise. So here's an example of practical methods for speeding up a practical-ish streaming program. You can contact me. There's the Flink book again. We're going to have copies of our streaming book, the previous one. This is the one Ellen and I did. Ellen and Costas did this one. Uh, the Flink book is not ready in hard copy, but we do have the streaming one. And immediately after this, we will be at our booth to sign that. There's a whole bunch of older books that are available as well. We write small books, one airplane ride in size, on specific topics where there's some new development that's consumable within that frame. So thank you. We have, I think, just a few moments for questions because the lady's been carefully raising the you're going too slow signs. Do we have any questions? <laughs> Surely more than the one during the talk. There you go. The man sits in the front. He's brave. Can you help him with the microphone? Yeah. So key takeaway from... Um, the threading thing was that less threads is better, or? No. It just looked like that. Uh, fewer application threads were better so that we could use more partitions that we wind up with many, many more system threads. That was the takeaway. We needed to put the threading resources in the right place. Right. And it's almost what you said, but not really. Okay. And, and that's always true. There, there's, these resources have to be in the right place, otherwise the system doesn't work as well as we'd like. Isn't this so cool? This is so trendy. A little pillow you talk to. Yeah, it's nice, like a beatbox. Um, a kind of question which might be considered a little bit heretic, but um, I really like the argument that you had at the beginning that streaming allows us to have something like private databases or to decouple the systems. But didn't we already have that? Like, 
way back in the 90s and even before that when we had things like um, message queues, uh, service buses, and things like that? Good point. Uh, no, was the short answer. Uh, so message queues were considered fast, beginning to be fast, if when you persisted the, the queue, you get tens of thousands of messages per second. But here we're talking about 10 million messages per second. And old style message queues were designed with semantics which had guaranteed exactly once sort of consumption, which implied that every write to the queue and every read from the queue was a full database commit involving all the writers and all the readers. And that just made them slow. They are orders of magnitude slower than a system that says, I will c write and commit things, but I will only coordinate with other writers. The readers, phew, forget them. And then the readers will only coordinate if they are within a single application group, consumer group. Otherwise, they're completely independent. That gets rid of these database transaction semantics. And very commonly, we even get rid of them even further by only committing every 1,000 messages or so. Because we're guaranteed ordered processing, that's no big deal. So basically, it would be that um, it's, it's now better, it's now faster, because we're not like, committing everything. We're keeping more in flight. Yeah. Um, we're allowing like parallel reads um, and those and, things. And this draw is driven by ratios. People think of sizes and speeds. But in fact, it's ratios that drive this. In 1986, the Fujitsu Eagle had 300 megabytes of usable space. And it had 15 megabit, I'm not sure if it's megabit or megabyte, interface. So in a few minutes, we could read everything on the disk or write. So the size of the disk was not 300 megabytes, it was 150 seconds. Current 8 terabyte disks have a size of something like 36 hours. So this is a huge thing, but it's only in the ratio that we see the real difference. But that ratio means that we cannot get to most of the disk right away anyway, so we might as well just keep a lot of it. And before, disks were so small that we had to delete things as quickly as possible. Possibly never even write them, just send them exactly to the consumer. But if I have to know all the consumers that are reading, I cannot de divide between them. I cannot modularize. I must persist to get modularization. And to get performance, I have to simplify those semantics. And that is the right answer with current ratios. That was a good answer in the 90s, the enterprise service bus, things like that. We had to control things. We had to limit them. But it's the wrong answer now. That was a great question, by the way. Anybody else? You want to just try the microphone? It, it's really exciting when somebody with the spotlight in their eyes is throwing it at you. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> no um, idea. So I was just curious, um, because you deployed task managers with um, 72 task slots, right? Originally. Right, originally, yes. Um, have you also, did you also try to um, split this up, like give only one task slot per task manager and just spawn more of these task managers and did you, if you tried that, observe that you had, this had less impact on performance? Uh, that's almost exactly what we did do, so clearly I said it poorly. We wound up with three task managers per physical node and each one of them had essentially one application thread to work on. Instead of one with 72, we wound up three with one. Now okay. that seems like a lot less processing, but it reserved processing for the, uh, the streams themselves. Yeah, that I get, but it's, well, to me it's not exactly the same because the same or sort of more equivalent would be if you had like 72 times 72 task managers or so. Yes, total, and that would have been much, team. much slower. Yeah, I guess so. And the reasons become memory, probably, at that point. Yeah. Because that would steal from caching for the file system or the data platform. Not really just files anymore. And my branding people keep trying to brand my forehead when I say file system, and they say converged data platform. Uh, and I get a little sizzly mark on my forehead as a result. 
but I'll get better at it. Files. Well, I mean, nobody complains if you have directories and symbolic links in a file system, right? They're not files. So, yeah. Anyway, but people get confused when you say file system. Is that it for questions? Are you people hiding in the back? Can't see you. There's got to be one more. There it is. Yeah, I just wanted to know um, if you can give some like ideas, like this, for example, three task manager is kind of a random number for me. Is there some specifics underneath that led to this, or is this just for this application? And if I want to optimize my application, I need to try and try different numbers? Or Almost all it? applications are going to be living in a soup of other applications. And so uh, they won't necessarily have to be optimized themselves to this extent. But yes, this is specific to applications. But notice that the, the final solution was pretty simple. One thread for consumer, two thread for producer, really. And lots, and we just did a grid search on number of partitions with very coarse steps until we got into a plateau of comparable performance. And so a thread or two or three per node for your application and as many partitions as you need to get the performance you need without swamping the cluster seems to be a good heuristic for doing this. Uh, having too many threads, it seems unlikely that you can fill them probably, largely because of lock contention. And the, the next actual interesting thing to do would be to have multiple clients per th task manager and then share small groups of threads to the different client connections. That would give us the parallelism within the same framework and avoid lock contingent. But there's still a lot of performance laying on the table. Uh, our engineers estimate that we should have gone almost four times faster, but it was end of the day, and the demand for this system is quite high, as you can imagine. Okay. Well, I'm going to head for the MapR booth to sign some books. I'd love to see you all anywhere near there, as you might want to be, unless there's one last question. Going once, twice, let's go. Thank you.